Um, so here we are. That will be the third uh, talk and the last one for this morning, during which I would present uh, the recent project I have been conducting at the PCMA. It was a 12-month project uh, sponsored by the ULAM program as part of the Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange uh, grant program. Uh, the title was Unraveling Nubian Funerary Practices, Textiles, and burial practices in ancient Sudan. Um, because it was a 12-month program and because uh, Sudan went, underwent some uh, political trouble during this time, I was not able to go to the field to actually get first-hand data. Mm -hmm. And it was decided pretty early on to focus uh, mainly on archival data. And for this reason, you will see that I mainly uh, focus my case studies on meritic and post-meritic uh, material uh, because this is my core area of expertise I would say uh, since my PhD and I had already quite a lot of preliminary data and studied textiles to bring together uh, to tackle um, the question of textiles in funerary contexts. And of course, this is when the presentation does not want to go forward. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I should uh, say that this presentation will contain images of human remains, and some of them are uh, a little bit graphic, so please be forewarned. Um, as you have seen in the previous two talks, the preservation of textiles is extremely good um, in Nubia and in Sudan in general. Um, but it be, it is much more probable uh, that any archaeologist will find textiles, first of all, in the uh, northern half of uh, this, let's say, Middle Nile um, part of the valley, because it is much drier. As much as you go uh, like more south and south, you would encounter seasonal rains um, that might have been actually uh, more prominent in the past as well. So the preservation of textile is definitely not as extensive. So let's say I started in the fourth cataract area all the way uh, to the Egyptian border and beyond, uh, you will find a rather high uh, preservation of textile uh, material, especially in uh, funerary contexts, because uh, the bodies were um, most of the time enveloped, uh, wrapped in textiles and deposited in very dry substrate away uh, from the agricultural uh, area and away from the settlement. Um, some of them they were disturbed by multiple reanimation practices, but um, nonetheless, the preservation tend to be quite good. Uh, during this talk, I will talk mainly about um, objects from Jebelada, uh, some found um, during the uh, SGE concession and also in Sai Island. As you can see here in this slide, compiling different um, fragments, different close-up of uh, textiles from the SGE collection in Uppsala. Um, most of the time, uh, the fabrics, the fibers themselves have retained a lot uh, of their structure, a lot of their texture and um, original shape and volume, I would say. Some cases can be quite desiccated, others can be even carbonized almost. But in many, many examples, um, the preservation of both color and material is very good. But um, in this sort of textile paradise, at least it, what should be a textile paradise for textile studies and textile archaeology, we encounter a few problems in our approach to study the textiles in funerary context. Uh, the first one is a rather important gap between the moment of discovery, a lot of them found in Nubia during the Nubian campaign in the 60s, and the moment of the textile studies. Uh, in the best of cases in the 60s, and two of the main uh, corpora were published rather soon after, uh, in the 70s, by textile specialists, but these people studied the textiles outside of their context with actually very little archaeological exca excavation notes and um, records to make sense of the textiles and for, let's say, to approach their use in the grave. 
Uh, it is kind of still the case today uh, when um, Magda and I, for example, um, intervene in several sites in Sudan, um, there tend to be a rather long delay between the time of excavation and the time of the study, depending on which uh, projects, of course, and all kinds of uh, contingencies. Um, this delay can be much more uh, helped with very good communication between the textile expert and archaeologist. But of course, when you work with textiles excavated in the 60s, that communication is most of the time not possible anymore. So we really rely on the quality of the archives. Um, what it means is that um, sometimes you feel a little bit frustrated um, when you reach the textiles, because, for example, here this grave shows a rather big volume of textile preserved. I um, give it an orange shade on the picture so you can see. Uh, this is the, a picture taken at Jebelada. But when you look at the textiles with the same tomb number, um, as much as I could ascertain, uh, this is what you are left with. So it is much more fragmentary because um, it seems that not everything was sampled at the time for diverse reasons. Of course, these excavations were conducted under very high pressure, be it time-wise or, um, or money-wise. Um, they had a very short time to excavate extremely large concessions, so it was not always um, possible uh, to conduct best practices. And of course, at the time, uh, they may not even have had like anthropologists uh, on site. So many um, uh, aspects of the excavations were hurried, and uh, sometimes the archive, even when they're very good, uh, leaves you with many, many questions. Uh, for me, my main uh, problem is then that most of the time I have archives, I have textiles, but I can't really relate uh, in them uh, to make sense um, of the textiles in context. The other problem is um, that in, in many situations, in um, funerary context for textiles, we are um, in the publication faced with quite blurry concepts. Um, a lot of polysemy under kind of um, these sort of like umbrella words such as shrouds, or um, in the literature on Nubian textiles, often the word sheet is employed. Um, but basically, um, it's very difficult to understand what the excavators or what the textile uh, person actually means by those. You find all kinds of words kind of used um, interchangeably. Garments, clothing layers, cloth, mummies, uh, painted shroud, binding tapes, padding. The body is dressed, it is wrapped, it is spread over the body. Uh, things are um, used, um, but not necessarily uh, very precisely defined. And that leads to three um, problems when um, time of the time of interpretation comes around. Um, the first one is that the nature of the object seemed to be in the literature either a garment or a wrapping. Um, most of the case, it was actually both, of course. It was first a garment during life, and then it was reused in the grave as wrappings. Um, but that is uh, rarely precise, and um, it seems to me, at least, reading those, um, those texts, that basically um, they always want to distinguish, is it a garment or is it a wrapping, uh, when actually I uh, advocate that these uh, categories are um, maybe not as uh, important uh, to identify in the tomb um, itself. Um, so basically what happens is that they are looking at a grave context, but the interpretation of the textile tend to be based on the realm of the living. We see, for example, um, that a rectangular piece was found in a grave, uh, but it is interpreted as it could have been used as a mantle. Maybe it was used as a mantle, so as a garment during life, but actually we have very little um, to base this assertion on at the time when we are studying it from a grave. Uh, it was used as a wrapping, it was used as a body support, it was used as other things, but in the grave it was actually not worn as a mantle, so we do not know um, the original use of the piece. Uh, this leads in the last kind of like um, phase to extrapolate um, the funerary practices to daily life practices and also the other way around. Uh, Safe Soderberg in the um, 
uh, introduction to the late Nubian textiles book uh, says that the dead were often buried naked. And a little bit uh, further, we hear him saying that the majority of the Nuba go naked. And it's, it's actually um, across the world, um, as John Peter says in one of his uh, article, actually, it is very rare for the dead to actually go in the grave naked. You would have to be extremely unlucky to end up um, buried uh, naked all the world uh, around, actually. So this idea of a naked grave is not um, at all uh, consistent with burial practices, and it has actually uh, not much to do uh, with the actual dress practice this is during lifetime. So uh, the solution to me at this point when I started my project was to go back uh, to the very basics of anthropology, of um, archaeotanatology, and instead of starting from the final object, from what we think we understand from it, uh, to start really from the funerary practices that generated the use in the first place. Uh, and that is very much based on the work uh, developed by Henri Dudet uh, in the Archaeology of the Dead or people such as uh, Roderick Sprague in his um, burial terminology. So the idea was to contextualize textile and to replace them in a sequence of funerary events. If we follow the burial uh, terminology proposed by uh, Roderick Sprague, uh, we hear that uh, there is a clear distinction between modes of body preparation, such as, for example, mummification, artificial mummification I hear, the dressing in clothing, the wrapping of the body, and the um, disposal containers, I would say, for example, blankets, animal hides, baskets, textiles, bark, coffins, etc. One of them is clearly an action, it's a phase, something that people do. And the other one is the objects. And those are not uh, always synonymous. So the objectives for the projects were uh, the following. To track the different modes of body wrappings. To conduct case studies determining the nature and arrangement of the artifacts on the body. To identify and understand maybe previously unnoticed funerary practices involving the wrapping and dressing of the dead to assess the role of body coverings in funerary rituals, and to establish a protocol for best practices in the in-situ study of funerary textiles. Uh, the goal was to, of course, uh, base it in Sudan, uh, but we also uh, did consultations with other colleagues to see how it could be applied uh, elsewhere. So I will start by objective number four. It may not be, <laughs> maybe make a lot of sense, but it is actually uh, quite important maybe to start by understanding the role of textiles uh, and of body coverings in the meritic uh, funerary practices. So just to paint you a little like a general picture of the meritic funerary world, I put a few pictures from Sedinga. So it's an elite cemetery in Lower Nubia where uh, the grave cavities were dug underneath a small mud brick pyramid. And you can see on the picture on the right, where you have um, an intact funerary deposit, the uh, assemblage of jars and bowls surrounding the deceased, um, both of them being laid uh, in coffins in this case. So the first thing that I tried to do was to try to understand, to contextualize the burial, the burial assemblage uh, itself. Uh, to understand sort of like uh, object category where the textiles could fit. Uh, in this case, I created this little diagram for myself where I distinguished the ritual objects here in blue, so things used for fumigation, libation, etc., uh, from the things uh, used for maybe the consumption of food here in um, purple personal equipment in orange, um, sort of power insignia objects such as games and furnitures and weapons that we find um, in meritic and post-meritic edit burial. Uh, from um, all the different layers surrounding the dead, um, him or herself. Um, so in light yellow, you have uh, objects belonging, let's say, to the dressing or the adorning of the body, and that could be uh, textiles along around the waist, for example, or jewelry, shoes, etc. 
wrappings, which could be soft wrappings in textiles or in leather, for example, harder uh, wrappings, let's say, if we understand it like that, like in a coffin, for example. Um, this body surrounded as such could then be placed on different support layers that could be soft, a blanket, for example, or hard in the case of, uh, let's say, like an Angareb bed or uh, like a stone uh, bench, for example, dug up inside the grave itself. And then the whole uh, assemblage being surrounded by the funerary chamber um, itself. And here uh, in that case, I used uh, very much this concept of the funerary chaîne opératoire, uh, which is based on the rite de passage uh, concept that uh, recognized the transformation of the individual statues from uh, a dead body, uh, deceased, all the way to um, a member of the community of the dead, let's say. Uh, so the transformation of the remains of the cadaver into inert remains. And you can see here on this um, Japanese uh, print, um, the decay of the body and the transformation of a body that was dressed at the beginning uh, in a very specific burial um, uh, dress all the way to inert remains of like sparse uh, skeleton um, parts. And I thought it was interesting to put this in a um, mirror of what we do find in Sudan, because we tend to see the skeleton in a grave or in some cases here, for example, from the Karanog drawing, um, we are left with a very skeletonized remain, when really what we have to picture at the time of the funeral is something that looks more like that. So um, a deceased that was very much covered by textiles indeed. Um, so to reconstruct the meritic funerary uh, chain opératoire, I used very much um, sort of like the latest um, tome on this question, the um, book published by Vincent Francini, Les Coutumes Funéraires dans le Royaume de Meroe, uh, that recognized different stages um, of this uh, funerary uh, chain opératoire. And just kind of like as a game almost, I tried to create a flow chart uh, of it. Um, following the different stages from the preparation to the animation, the funeral, and then the later reintervention um, phase, all the way to the rediscovery. Each of these stages, of course, having an impact on the textile material. And here I really much uh, dissociated the actions uh, in rectangular boxes from the actual objects. Um, and we can see, for example, that the textiles are an object, they are um, part of the assemblage you need to put together to bring a disease to rest, but it is also, they are also part of different stages, different actions of preparing the body um, that correspond to the dressing, adorning of the body, the wrapping, but also the placing the body on its funerary support. And when you draw it a little bit like that, so it is a bit more um, visual maybe, uh, you can see here all the little T uh, signs, the yellow stars are different moments inside this funeration operatoire where the textiles uh, can be um, occurring, can be um, uh, basically an essential actor of the funerary process. So now let's, uh, from this, um, understanding, we can try to track the different modes of body wrappings. Um, and I work here with an illustrator who helped me put this together and a colleague working on terminology to try to really understand the different ways that textile intervene around the body itself. Um, so first of all, the textile can be worn. In that case, it means really it encloses, it dresses the body uh, as uh, it could have done during life. So you could have examples where the textile is a clear recognizable garment. In this case here, you have a loincloth. Or you can have a wraparound textile piece uh, that could be sometimes incomplete, which is a torn off band of textiles, um, textile that could be, for example, encircling the waist, um, as it is the case here. Both example coming from the SGE material. Another uh, configuration would be that a textile um, supports the body. Um, so the, let's say, most common case 
would be the big, uh, large blanket or thick textile that were placed underneath uh, the body or rolled up or let's say like bundled up under the shoulder, under the head uh, of the body as a sort of a pillow. Um, so here I find it quite interesting, but it's because it creates this kind of mirror between the sleeping uh, during life. This type of blankets is uh, hypothesized to be used as a sleeping surface during life. Um, and it transposes it during the grave, really showing a parallel between sleeping uh, through a sort of, of like um, transitory night uh, until the disease can be reborn in the afterlife. Here you have another example of uh, this sort of large uh, blankets that can be found um, in Nubia or in Sudan in general. A lot of the cases um, are made with this very thick pile weave uh, technique with loops or extra threads that creates the sort of like a cushy thick uh, surface. Another uh, case would be the wrapping uh, of the body and I will uh, talk a little bit more about this one later on as well. Um, and because there is different uh, modes to wrap the body as well. Um, so, um, and also it really much depends if uh, the wrapping covers the entire uh, body or if some parts are still exposed. Um, if the textile are used as a whole envelope or it's only um, sort of like individual layers spread on top of it. You also find bindings. Uh, so in these cases, the textiles are reused. They're torn into bands most of the time. Uh, when you come to the medieval time, some uh, bindings were purposely made for, uh, for funerary purposes, but it's not necessarily the case uh, in the Meritic period where you have noted ropes and binding tapes that could either like maintain the body in position uh, or um, sort of like attach the wrappings around the body. And finally, you have some cases of stuffing. You find sort of like body bundles that were um, stuffed um, with torn off textiles or whole textiles to kind of give it a specific shape. It is quite rare to be honest in Sudan, but it is something that you found more frequently in Egypt, for example. So the other... Um, goal was to conduct case studies to try to determine the nature and the arrangement of the artifacts on the body. And that, of course, was quite difficult only from archival material. Um, I had planned to go to the field, but it turned out that it was not uh, possible uh, because um, of the uh, military events in Sudan, unfortunately. So um, I worked mainly on archives, some more recent, such as this one from Sai Island where I got to study the textiles in the Sudan National Museum and then uh, had the, the archival photos uh, from Vincent Francini with the Sai Island Archaeological Mission. And uh, in that case, it was possible to trace the use uh, of this particular textile alongside the back of the legs uh, and so, so lower back of this uh, individual, this female individual that was pulled out of the cavity um, and on top of the closing wall. Uh, and I sort of like colored here the textiles in red so you can see the location a little bit. So um, in that case, probably indicating the wrapping of the lower limbs uh, of this uh, individual with these sort of very long textiles with fringes at the bottom. Here, another case that I uh, conducted from the uh, Scandinavian Joint Expedition archives and the textiles uh, that are today uh, stored at the Gustavianum Museum of the University of Uppsala was this grave, uh, the grave number two from Ashgate, uh, where it was possible to um, cross-reference the textiles that I found uh, at the museum, so four different textiles um, with uh, the archive to sort of like hypothesize this superposition of different types of wrappings uh, noted uh, around the body, some of them uh, for sure, and then a more sort of more substantial uh, layer, the one with the, um, the little tassels here, um, that I hypothesize being on top. This reconstruction drawing, I have to say, is a complete hypothesis. It's uh, just a working uh, drawing. 
And then a much thicker and much more decorated piece with lotus flower and palmettes in different shades of blue that could have been used either here as the drawing indicates underneath the body or maybe on top of it. Um, yeah, so that's like two examples of the case studies. Um, and then uh, observing these different um, material, the database that I created, sort of like cross-referencing every in situ uh, textile, every textile that I had studied for which I had in situ information, I should say, I tried to identify maybe some uh, practices that were not necessarily noticed um, before from sort of like cursory examination. Um, my first uh, hypothesis, the first idea that I'm submitting here uh, today, is a textile gesture um, that was uh, seemingly associated to the bodies of adult women. It is um, attested in AXA. I also have a case from um, a site from the Scandinavian Joint Expedition and the one in SAI that I mentioned previously. Uh, in this case, it seems possible to trace uh, the wrapping of the lower body only, um, which would have left the chest uh, exposed as these pictures show. And uh, in all cases, the textiles that were used seem to be a very large rectangle piece uh, bordered by rows of fringes. And that textile usually is associated with wrapped around garments such as very long skirts um, that are also visible on the iconography of these elite uh, women. So here I hypothesize a sort of correspondence between this type of wrapping practices and the clothing practices that were actually carried out during the woman's life. It's very much, it's yeah, an hypothesis that I'm bringing out there. I hope we'll find more material to either confirm or infirm it. The second hypothesis that is also actually visible on Magda's uh, material from uh, later uh, burials is the superposition of different textiles with varying density. So um, probably the lighter fabric being closer to the body. And then as you go outside of the body bundle, I would say, you find a denser and denser fabric. Uh, here it is uh, visible uh, on this sort of like mass of sediment uh, with bones uh, from Sedinga. Um, it's actually little bones from the hands. Um, that have uh, two layers on both like the top and um, bottom layer has two different layers of textile preserves. Um, textile B that tend to be uh, quite thinner. I know these pictures don't show anything, <laughs> it's just black uh, fragments, but when you do the, the textile analysis you realize that the, the weave and the threads are much thinner in textile B as they are in textile A, uh, so sort of like showing this superposition uh, from thin to thick uh, on and around the body, especially visible in meritic remains, as far as I can see from sensitive areas such as the hands or the skull maybe, uh, but better attested for the entire body as uh, Magda can correct me if I'm wrong, on the entire body. So finally, the goal was to establish a protocol for best practices in excavation, analysis, and conservation of funerary textiles. It's just a set of propositions, I would say, uh, that we put together with a working group during one of the seminars that we um, organized at the beginning of the project, with archeologists and anthropologists working in Sudan, but also other colleagues working in Egypt and in Europe. Um, it is very much based also in um, sort of like other protocols that have been produced for the excavation of um, organic material in general. But in that case, what we were very much um, conscious of was the documentation in situ, which um, is really kind of like loophole in the um, current practices, I would say, for different reasons. Um, most of them, um, Actually, we can assign them to time uh, because we don't necessarily have a lot of time. Um, not every excavation have a physical anthropologist, for example, excavating every graves. Um, so the level of documentation varies accordingly. 
So far as the four uh, sort of main points of the documentation in situ to be carried out at the time of excavation uh, is the preliminary assessment of the number and types of different fabrics. And for these, for none of these, I should say, you need to be a textile expert that could be carried out very easily, uh, as you will see. Uh, then the mapping of the textiles on the body, um, detailed photographs in situ, and the sort of basic description and uh, inventory. And this can be uh, as basic, basic as uh, you can make it, but at least to assign single um, numbers to single pieces of textiles, because what happened most of the time is that every textile is uh, bundled up in a bag, with uh, the grave number, and they're not even making it, I would say, to the inventory of the grave. They're kind of like this in-between category of object, not really belonging to the body, because they're separated, uh, but not really belonging to the burial goods, such as pottery, for example, which receive an inventory number. Um, so it depends. It really depends on the practice in the excavation. Uh, but to actually give them a single inventory number um, to make our job easier, basically, afterwards. Uh, because, of course, this become much more interesting when you can have a close collaboration between the different specialists that intervene around the grave, including a textile um, specialist, from the beginning to the end, to the interpretation and across analysis. And as we have discussed also uh, earlier, to actually also have a little bit of, um, like to ask good questions to, to ensure the preservation of the artifacts. Mm. So to recognize and map the textile on the body, uh, I told you I could not access the fields, but I did something very quickly uh, yesterday to show you on my kitchen floor. Um, and this is a picture I took with an iPad and I just very quickly took notes uh, with the um, iPad pencil, uh, but you can do that in many ways. You can do just a schematic drawing. And I, I put very, very easy notes such as under the head, thick, beige, something that um, anybody you know can um, recognize and note in the field. And then when you open it or you have a several layer, several phase of cleaning, uh, you can start um, sort of assigning colors or letters to the pieces that you can recognize with your um, sort of like layman eye and that could be really much by color or texture, whatever um, you decide. But just to assign very sort of like as clear as you can indication of the location uh, of the textile. And of course, detailed photographs. And if you can uh, do 3D modeling, some um, anthropologists are doing this on a much more, um, I want to say, regular um, uh, manner, but it's not always the case. It depends on many things. Uh, but I think for textile studies in, in this particular case, it's something that would be extremely uh, beneficial to conduct, especially if you have a well-preserved in situ Animation. So yes, it is turning, but of course that is <laughs> sort of like I was just a tryout that we did for training purposes. Um, so yeah, just to show you how it could work. A basic inventory, as I mentioned, could be extremely, extremely uh, easy. Thick fabric looks like a blanket. Um, that's enough, really. Um, and then the location is under the body. This is where I can see it, um, you know, under the head, but also a little bit under the torso, maybe. It can be full of question marks. It really doesn't matter. Uh, the importance is that there is a trace um, so that when you actually manage to have a textile person on site, maybe, uh, that person can sort of like um, backtrack the process and uh, manage to reconstruct the role of textile in this particular animation. So, of course, it's always uh, kind of a help to have a textile person on call. Uh, we'll be more than glad to answer any requests or quick assessment from WhatsApp or whatever. Uh, so please feel free to talk to us. Uh, we are many, <laughs> uh, more than uh, we may, you may think, I don't know. Uh, so we'll be very happy uh, to lend a hand. 
And uh, to finish and to sort of like tie up uh, these three different talks, I wanted uh, to say that uh, we can, of course, study the textile that is found in a grave. But as Magda and John Peter showed, we can give you information on the raw resources um, of like used around the site itself, the techniques, the craft knowledge uh, that was required uh, within the population, and also a more like societal use during life as dress or as utilitarian um, textile, but also during death for um, burial practices. So very quickly to just of like wrap up this project, I would say, um, the dissemination um, um, led to several presentation and conferences, of course, and to the organization of two seminars, this one uh, included, but um, maybe more uh, importantly in that case, the opening seminar that we did over two days um, to really uh, try to understand different um, use of textiles in the grave uh, and during which we worked at the uh, conception of this protocol together with our colleagues in the Euroweb project, which is a cost uh, network, uh, also hosted at the University of Warsaw, uh, which Bihai Agata Ulanowska is here in the audience today. So thank you uh, for this very helpful seminar indeed. And then the publications are mostly to come, unfortunately. The articles are almost finished. Um, I've worked very much with a colleague, uh, you have seen her drawing, uh, Rosemary Henson, on the visualization of these different types of wrappings. Um, so this will be kind of like published as models so that anybody can uh, use, hopefully, uh, to better assess the role of textiles in grave. And we are also publishing with Magda the proceedings from this funerary textiles in situ workshop. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I want to also thank everybody at uh, BCMA, uh, specifically Arthur Obluski, who uh, welcomed the project. But uh, one first and foremost, I should say, Magda, who helped uh, all the way from the conception of the application to the publication of the results. So thank you very much to everyone. OK, um, thank you. Oh, I see that I have spoken a lot. <laughs> so thank you. I'll welcome any questions that